Uh, I'd like to thank all you people. You know that uh, I always get nervous at the end and I forget to uh, uh, say some things, but thank you for coming. You know how much this means to me. And I want to thank TJ for the great job he did and Stephen. Without those two, it would have been a mess uh, with all his differences. So thanks, uh, TJ Hicks and Stephen. Uh, I really mean that. Okay, and uh, I want to, where did I leave off? I did Adam's Own East. I did Webster. I did that. There's Polk and Clay. Did you look up John Tyler? Nobody went home and Googled John Tyler. I was going to put him up and I forgot. Uh, but, uh, all right. All right, the Mexican War was fought between May of 1846 and February of 1848. Uh, we won every battle. The reason we dominated, uh, two, two reasons, I think, we had a superior navy. Mexico had virtually no navy. And we had a great navy, no, not a great navy, but a, perhaps the fifth or sixth best navy in the world at that time. And that gave us tremendous ability to move troops and supplies around, especially in California, where part of the uh, war was fought. The Bear Flag revolt up around Sonoma. Uh, there were not very many Mexican soldiers stationed anywhere in California. Uh, and when our uh, Navy and, and John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder, just happen, happened to be with a small army contingent, just happened to be uh, near uh, the Bay area when the war broke out, and he joined with these bare flaggers, Americans already living in California, and uh, they easily overthrew the Mexican rule in California. There were a couple battles, one down near San Pasqual, a couple skirmishes around San Diego and L.A., uh, the Bear Flag Revolt. And uh, when, when they did declare their independence, they put together a hasty flag, and for some reason they put a grizzly bear on it. And they put one star, because they were the lonely star like Texas, California. But when they won the, got Mexico, to, uh, the, the general up there to sign away, uh, to surrender in essence, they declared California Republic, the Bear Flag Republic. And now we're the Bear Flag State, that's our state flag. And, uh, and, and then immediately, of course, they asked to be annexed to the United States. And we didn't hesitate. Uh, we had no intention of taking California. Polk didn't say that a million times. Uh, but now we had California. We extended coast to coast. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, again, was uh, sweeping. We got all of Texas. Look how big Texas was at that time. Uh, we got all of what is now California, Nevada, Utah, uh, parts of New Mexico, all New Mexico, Arizona, all the way up into Wyoming, for goodness sakes. So we took half of Mexico. That Gads and Purchase is going to come in about 10 minutes. We're going to take that too. Uh, but uh, we, the Mexican session, did we feel a little guilty? Yeah, we won the war, won every battle, da 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 da. We lost 13,000 men, by the way, in the Mexican War, 11,000 to disease, Montezuma's revenge, uh, and we lost uh, 2,000 plus to bullets, including Henry Clay's son, uh, Henry Clay's favorite son. He had a bunch of kids, but his favorite son was killed at the Battle of Buena Vista uh, up in northern Mexico. So anyhow, we took that, but we felt so guilty, we, gave, we paid the Mexicans $15 million dollars which we certainly didn't have to do, but we did at that time, that was a lot of money. And three and a quarter million we assumed in damages uh, that Mexico admitted owing American people. So we could, you could say in some high school books, you see we paid 18 and a half, a quarter million from uh, the Mexican session. Others say uh, we only paid 15 million. The, the truth is we paid 15 million outright and assumed damages for three and a quarter million. Not a bad deal, not a bad deal whatsoever. And also during the Mexican War, we had been arguing for a long time with England about the, about the, uh, let me get down to it. We had been arguing about, I mean, look what, well, after the Compromise of 1850, Texas gave up all of that land. There's the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But after the war, uh, we arranged something in 1850 called the Compromise of 1850. Henry Clay organized it. And Texas agreed to give up a lot of land to New Mexico and uh, some other areas. But that's when Texas took its familiar panhandle shape that it has to today. And the rest of the Mexican session was originally organized in Utah and New Mexico, and they were later subdivided. And, of course, California uh, stayed basically the same as it was. We, there was some talk we should have taken Baja, California, uh, but we did not, partly because we thought it was too uh, 
too rugged, the climate was wrong, and uh, whatever. So we, we, we were satisfied to go to where California is today. And California was admitted uh, as the 31st state in 1850, as part of the Compromise of 1850. And California, it was a big argument over slavery by that time, and California demanded to be a free state. And California actually made a lot of demands, and uh, you ever hear the golden rule? California got everything it wanted because of the golden rule. Just as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was being signed, American luck, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. So almost simultaneous, with the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the gold strike. Oh my gosh. So California had the golden rule. We will be a state immediately, and we will be a free state, or else we're going our own way. And we said, yes, California, yes, California, uh, yes, California, and I don't blame us. So there we go, the golden state. Uh, and then we had been arguing with England over to Oregon country, look how big it was, all the way up to 5440. A uh, member of the Treaty of 1818 or the Convention of 1818 had called for joint occupation of all of that from the California border all the way up to 54 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude. Notice Polk didn't give him didn't get 54-40, he didn't get a fight, he was going to compromise. Uh, California, or England had for long been willing to just draw the 49th parallel out to the Pacific. They would take the northern part of Oregon, we would take the southern part, and the only difference was they wanted all of Vancouver Island, so we would draw a little hook there, but up, up, up to basically the Pacific, it would be the 49th parallel as it is today. So we settled the Oregon dispute. Uh, uh, the fact that we were at war with Mexico we didn't want to alienate England. We knew that we could easily win in California to war using our Navy to move troops between basically San Francisco and San Diego, which the Mexicans could not do, of course. So we didn't, the last thing in the world we wanted to do was alienate the greatest naval power in the world at that time, England, and it would be until after World War I when we passed her. So uh, it made sense to accept that, and Polk did, uh, except the uh, the split at the 49th parallel. The only argument was this area around the Columbia River here, this little green area. Uh, and uh, the Hudson Bay Company, which was the main fur trading uh, outfit of England in, in that area, they, they told the British that uh, the government that, the, the, that was already trapped out. Could you imagine? The English already felt that they had over-trapped the beavers there by, uh, by the 1840s, for goodness sakes. Uh, so they said, give the Americans that area. The Columbia River is not what it's uh, cut out to be. It's not the St. Lawrence of the West. It's not the Mississippi. Mississippi of the West, give it to the Americans, just take Northern Oregon, uh, we're better off with that. And we, we agreed to, to that, so under Polk, if you want to, if I could go back once, under Polk, if you want to argue, we got Texas, New Mexico, that, California and Oregon. Was he a great president? Now they say no. I say, I question that. Uh, he was going to do four things, lower the tariff, reinstitute the independent treasury, the government banking thing where the government would hold its own money. He was going to lower the tariff. Uh, he was going to settle the Oregon dispute, acquire California. He did all of them, went home and died at the age of 53, a couple months after he left the White House. What, what more could you ask for a president? Uh, and again, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again, he was a land grab and SOB, but I want uh, political correctness is going away here. He was my land grabbing SOB. Uh, and am I glad he grabbed all that land? I hate to say it, yes I am. All right, and his argument again was the old manifest destiny. These people out here, the Mexicans, the Indians, whatever, they're all better off under our benign rule than they were under Mexican rule or their own tribal rule or whatever, right? So there you go, and the Indians didn't get even with us until they built casinos. All right. <laughs> So Ed, there you got a ma magnificent area, my God. And it, the Oregon went all the way up to uh, 5440 was the Alaska panhandle. And now, oh, the Gadsden Purchase. This southern part of Arizona is still right here. It, what is now Arizona and New Mexico. That Gadsden Purchase was not included in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, south of the Gila River, Gila River, right there, 
dual pronunciation of that. Uh, we had not included that. This was still part of Mexico. Uh, but we, by 1853, there was a guy named Franklin Pierce who was president, but his secretary of war, who really ran the cabinet, was Jefferson Davis, name familiar, uh, would go on to be president of the Confederacy. Hang old Jeff Davis by a sour apple tree. Uh, Jefferson Davis, how about that? I once lost uh, 100 bucks on a radio calling show when I was in college, which was a lot of money. They, 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 you called in every week, they asked you American trivia. And I, I was the winner, and, but I would go from $50 to 100 if I knew this one last question. And he said, what American president had a, a, a wife by the name of Verena? I figured it was one of Clinton's girlfriends. Maybe I could guess that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, I had no clue. Verena Davis, she was an American first lady of the Confederate States of America, right? CSA. Uh, rip down her statue, I tell you. All right, but anyway, why did Jeff Davis and Pierce uh, want this area? We were thinking about building a transcontinental railroad, which we would complete in 1869, but the railroad we did build at first went from basically Omaha, uh, Omaha, Nebraska Council, Bluffs, Iowa, that area, all the way into Oakland and then from Oakland into the, uh, in, into the Pacific Ocean. That's how we built the first transcontinental, completed in 1869, just after the Civil War. Uh, that basically follows, if you've ever driven coast to coast on Route 80, uh, it somewhat follows that. It's amazing how they could get all those mountains. I only saw my father scared once in, in my whole life. Uh, he was frightened when we were going through the Rocky Mountains that way. When are these mountains going to end? And we were hillbillies from Pennsylvania, but nothing like the Rockies, for God's sake. And he was actually praying the mountains would end. I never saw a guy kiss the desert like him when he saw it. Huh? Uh, but anyway... Davis and, and, and Pierce were pro-South, even though Pierce was from New Hampshire. He was what they called a doe face, a northern man who supported the South, a northern man with southern principles. He was moldable, hence a doe face. Uh, that's the basic reason. But anyway, Davis wanted the railroad to go from New Orleans to Los Angeles which was already hooked up to San Francisco. So it would be the same thing. You'd still get to the gold fields, and you'd include the San Diego, L.A. area. Fine. And he, they wanted the railroad to go this way. And that area south of the river, that was very flat land, uninhabited, no Indians, no buffaloes, very, very just perfect railroad land, flat. You could build a track. You didn't have to worry about trestles or any other stupid thing. So th what Davis uh, did is convince Pierce to buy that land from Mexico. And even though it was only a few years after the Mexican War, our relations with Mexico had improved. And we approached the Mexicans, and Santa Ana was still around. And we said, how about we buy that land south of the Gila River? Uh, and they said, what the hell you want that for? It's not worth any. If you're crazy enough to buy it, yeah. But what? And we were going to give them $15 million for that area, but it would include this area down here on the Gulf of California. But when, when Pierce brought the treaty back to the Senate for approval, some senators said 15 million for that is too much. So, and, and the Northern senators weren't too anxious to set up a competing route for the railroad. So the compromise was we'd only take part of the Gadsden area, we'd leave this area, go, which we shouldn't have, but we'd only pay 10 million. So there are some signs down along that area, which I've seen, which said we bought this money, this area for 15 million. Other signs say 10 million. The truth is it was 10 million. When the final deal was made, we did not accept the outlet to the Gulf of California. It didn't seem important at the time. And we, uh, we gave the Mexicans 10 million. So there you go. And that, com that was the last area we ever added to what would become the contiguous 48 states. That was it. When I was, till I was in what, uh, I don't know, what, 1959, what was, I wasn't born yet, who am I kidding? <laughs> All right, uh, my birth certificate says that, of course it's doctored, but anyway, uh, a couple signs down there get it wrong, but until we added Alaska and Hawaii, of course, we, in 59, we only had the 15, uh, 48 states, and that, that was the last addition to the contiguous 48, the famous Gadsden Purchase, famous, most people never heard of it. James Gadsden was a South Carolina railroad promoter, 
And that's the man that Pierce sent down to deal with the Mexicans. And the Mexicans thought we had lost our minds. What are you giving us 10 million for nothing, for desert land? Next thing you know, you're going to want to buy something in the Coachella Valley or something. Uh, hey, maybe Americans will be dumb enough to buy that. Okay, so that was the Gadsden purchase. Come on, look, come up. Okay. Now, there's the Gadsden flag. You ever see that? If you're a gun right guy or woman, uh, if you're a right winger, but particularly if there's some motorcycle gangs, but particularly if gun rights people, they've adopted this. Don't tread on me. And they, the original don't tread on me did not have the apostrophe in the don't. Uh, don't that's it with the kind of yellowish background. It's showing more green there. It's a timber rattlesnake uh, ready to strike. Don't tread on me. Uh, that uh, was called the Gadsden flag. And it, you see it all around now. And, but if you see anybody with the Gadsden flag, don't back any liberals. Be careful. Uh, don't be woke or anything like that. All right. Uh, but it, it, it tends to be a right-wing gun type support, have this don't tread on me symbols. Uh, still see them around. Saw some flags in the development we're staying in today. There you go. But uh, it was not James Gadsden. It was his grandfather, Christopher Gadsden, who uh, designed that flag during the American Revolution. The grandfather, the guy that produced the Gadsden Purchase. He was a, in charge of a bunch of Marines uh, during the Revolutionary War, a volunteer unit that they called the Marines, not the Marine Corps we have today, but a group of Marines, so to speak. And Christopher Gadsden came up with that flag, uh, that symbol. And uh, he was a great fighter, a uh, very brave guy during the American Revolution. And uh, that flag has stayed with us today. So there you go. Now, we, now we're done grabbing, right? We have everything we could possibly want. We have from Canada to Mexico, half of Mexico. We're from the Atlantic to the Pacific. We have all this land. We're about third, fourth biggest country in the world at this time. That's enough, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Never enough. Uh, always too much and never enough. Let's, we're going to purchase Alaska today. Then we're going to fight the Spanish-American War in 1898. That's... My favorite American war, the war you declare, you go, you beat the hell out of your opponent in 100 days, you force a peace treaty, come home, have a parade, and it's all over in 100 days. That's, that's, uh, we call it the splendid little war. Just like some people now call World War II the good war. It was our best fought war. But there's no such thing as a good war when 400,000 Americans died. To me, that, that scares me to say, it, it was a great war for us, yes, but not a Good, not good in the sense that it was nice for all those people that died and were wounded. I loved World War II vets that came into my dad's bar. I, I thought they were the greatest guys. Unfortunately, there are not a heck of a lot around anymore, but they were just the greatest guys. All right, so let's do the Alaska, and then uh, we'll get into the Philippines and Me uh, Cuba and some other stuff. All right. Swords Folly. In 1867... We bought Alaska, that huge area, now our biggest state, for $7,200,000. Two cents an acre, it turned out. Better deal than Louisiana. And who got this? The United States. The two greatest real estate deals, legitimate ones in, in history, the Louisiana Purchase and the Alaska Purchase. Who benefited by both? Us. Are we lucky? Oh, our luck was running out. If I were teaching this course in Mexico, I would say one thing right here. We took all that territory from Mexico, California, Utah, New Mexico, right? What the Mexican War did is cause a civil war. The argument started immediately after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. What about slavery out there? Are we going to allow slaves in California? It seemed like a warm area. Uh, today, California produces more cotton than any other state. So could have we been a slave? Certainly. They knew New Mexico and Arizona, or at least it was warm. They didn't know how, about the rainfall or whatever. But So we start arguing about slavery out in the Mexican session. We never completed that argument until we fought the Civil War. So if I were teaching this in the University of New Mexico, I would say the gringos lost only uh, 2,000 men to bullets and 11,000 to disease to take half our country. But the Mexican session caused an argument over slavery in the territories, which caused a civil war. And in that war, 600,000 Americans died. Now they're upping it. It's even higher. But if you count the North and South together, together we lost 600,000 in the civil war. Let me make a statement that was true when I taught my first class in 1969 at the age of two. All right. Uh, 
I could say this legitimately in 1969. More Americans died in the Civil War than all the rest of our wars put together. We lost 2% of our population in the Civil War. We only had 30 million people, lost 600,000. And that counted 4,000 plus slaves. Okay. If we had a civil war today and lost that same percentage, we'd lose over 6 million people. Now, if something happened in the United States and we lost 6 million people, would we remember it? If anybody ever tells you there was a more important event in American history than the Civil War, tell them they're nuts. Or don't talk to them, because they're stupid, brainwashed, whatever. The Civil... I hate when somebody says, defining moment of the game. It's the Lakers are ahead by 30 points and LeBron dunks one. Ah, it's the defining moment. Yeah, okay. Uh, but the defining moment of American history, there is no question. No, there's no argument was the Civil War. World War II might be second, the Depression might be third, but the Civil War, I mean, no, no doubt about it. All right, well, after the Civil War, uh, the Secretary of State was a guy named William Seward. Another one of these handsome guys. There you go. William Seward. So it would be Seward's folly. He was Secretary of State under Lincoln. He was supposed to get the Republican nomination in 1860. But it went to Lincoln instead when uh, the convention blocked Seward. He was by far the most powerful Republican. By far. And he was supposed to be the nominee in 1860, but a couple really bad breaks occurred, and Republicans had to turn to a dark horse, unexpected candidate, and Lincoln was the guy that got the nomination, wound up leading us through the Civil War. And when uh, Lincoln was reelected in 1864, he took as his vice president a Democrat, a war Democrat, because many Democrats were supporting the war, so Lincoln rewarded them by calling himself a Union Party man and took one of them as a vice president. Who cares about the vice president? Well, it was Andrew Johnson. And then Lincoln, of course, is assassinated a month into his second term, and Andy Johnson is now president. He's a disaster. No other way to look at it. He's a disaster as president. All right? So, Seward stayed on as Secretary of State. Lincoln made him Secretary of State. He said to Seward when he was nominated, if I win, you could have any job you want. And Seward picked Secretary of State, very similar to what Obama and Hillary Clinton a few years ago. Right? You, it, w but when you have the guts to take your chief rival, who in every way possible is more famous and stronger than you, when you have the guts to take him as your, in your cabinet, you have guts. I would never do that. I'd pick some flunkies that would make me look good. I don't want to pick somebody who's going to show me up. I'm never going to, if I get into movies, I'm not going to have Brad Pitt as my backup, you know. Uh, I'm going to pick one of the three Stooges or something. Uh, but anyhow, Seward was an expansionist. He stayed on as Secretary of State under Johnson. He served under Lincoln until Lincoln was shot. He then stayed under, uh, under Johnson, even though Johnson had a falling out with the Republicans, because he wasn't really a Republican, of course. Uh, but Seward was an expansionist. Now, the Russians, the myth is they're so stupid they didn't know anything about Alaska. And, uh, and they didn't realize how that... Yes, they did. The Russians knew that Alaska had a lot of potential. Gold, they knew there were minerals there. They were already getting some. They knew the fur trading and the sealing, the seal skins were a big thing. They, Alaska just had so much going for it. And the cold weather, of course, didn't bother the Russians. So that was just like Russia, what the heck's different. And, but remember, Russia had all of Siberia that it had not yet developed. If they couldn't even develop their neighbor, their, it was part of Russia, but if they couldn't even develop Siberia, which was contiguous, how the heck are they going to develop Alaska? They aren't. And the last thing the Russians wanted, the last thing, was for the English to come out of Canada, their main rival England, to come out of Canada and take Alaska. Because they knew the value, and they weren't stupid, they knew the value of Alaska. So... The Russians wanted to unload Alaska, but to someone beside the English. Remember, there had been a war in the 1850s, I think one of the most underrated wars in world history, the Crimean War. Very bloody war, charge of the Light Brigade, that's where we get the, uh, the, 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 the Tennyson's poem, The Charge, Florence Nightingale was there. But it was, uh, it was a big war in the Crimean Peninsula that, of course, Putin took over a few years ago. It's right now, where he might come out of to going to Ukraine uh, today, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, the Russians and British hated each other. It was not that many years after the Crimean War. 
The Russians knew that the British had this great navy, of course, everybody knew that. So rather than lose Alaska to the British, have it become part of Canada, they offered it to Seward. Seward jumped at the opportunity, and he asked Congress for the money, 7200000 to buy Alaska. Many people thought it was a waste of money, Seward's polar bear garden, Seward's icebox, Seward's folly, Icelandia. Somebody wanted to call it Icelandia, except there already was a country kind of called Iceland. So we, they wanted to call it the icicle capital of the world. Uh, but <clears throat> Seward convinced Congress, he convinced Congress that it was worth it. And when the vote came to appropriate the money, it was almost unanimous, not quite, but almost unanimous. Uh, to fork out the 7200000 Another reason we now know that Congress was willing to go over and buy it is because the Russians bribed American congressmen and senators. They gave them a little money behind the back, something our current politicians would never, ever. <laughs> None of them would take money from a foreign government to, uh, no way. Oh my God, remember, those were the bad old days. Yeah, all right, we buy Antarctica. What, what did Trump, he wanted to buy Greenland. Right, Greenland, okay. But uh, not only uh, did the Russians grease some paws, we now think they spent close to a million dollars of the 7200000 on bribes to American businesses and American politicians to get Alaska off their hands. But also, during the Civil War, America's defining moment, the greatest achievement of Lincoln and Seward, I don't think there's any doubt, was keeping every other country out of the war. The reason we won the revolution is what? It became a world war, France came in, Spain came in, the Dutch came in. Right? The only reason we won the American Revolution, I told you, is the world war. So if the North could keep everybody out of the Civil War, if the North could do that, and if the North could just stick it out, in a long haul, they couldn't lose, and we didn't, because California was a union state, so I could say we. So that was the same thing here. Uh, during the Civil War, if everybody stayed out of it, we're, the North's going to win, and that's exactly what happened. Lincoln and Seward skillfully kept England out. One thing Seward did, England was on a verge of coming in at one point, and uh, in fact, France went into Mexico during the war, take advantage of our war, Maximilian period of Mexican history. And then we, we, we ousted him after the Civil War and the Mexicans put him before a firing squad. But the French did take advantage of the war. They didn't help the South, but they came into Mexico. All right, anywho, the only country that kind of rooted for the North, not because they loved the North, but because they hated England and France, was Russia. Russia was kind of pro-North. And during the war, at a really bad time in the summer of 1863, right as Gettysburg was being fought, terrible battle, worst battle in American history. But anyhow, at that point, Russia sent 12 ships to the United States, 12 warships, six to New York, six to San Francisco. And we thought that was to show the English and the French that if they came in on the south side, Russia was gonna come in on the side of the north. That wasn't really the reason, peripheral reason maybe, but the, we thought the Russians were our good, good friends and we wanted to reward the Tsar uh, for, uh, for sending these ships over. So why did we buy Alaska almost unanimously when push came to shove? Seward knew it was a bargain. Most American people who had been up in that area knew it was a tremendous bargain. Uh, also because of the fact that we wanted to repay Russia, uh, if you will. We didn't want Alaska to fall into British hands. And also Seward convinced the American people, get this one, my last Canada mention. If we got Alaska, we now had part of Oregon, correct? That would box in British Columbia, which was very lightly po populated, and it was not overly patriotic toward the British rule. So if we boxed in British Columbia and infiltrated, we could take what? British Columbia, maybe not all of Canada, but British Columbia, and that would give us a complete domination of the Asiatic trade, which was now booming because the ships were getting better and they could get across the Pacific. So if we wanted to dominate the Pacific trade, we would eliminate England using British Columbia as a base. How about that one, huh? Uh, how about money meaning something to the United States? Never, never, never. Uh, we did it because God told us to take Alaska, that's right. Uh, Christianize the uh, Eskimos, sure. There's Seward. 
And now, the last kind of thing, we're going to go into the Pacific. Now well, we got Alaska. There you go, Seward's Folly. All right. During the late 19th century, we're going to take Puerto Rico over here, basically take Cuba for all intents and purposes. We're going to take Hawaii. We, uh, we settled midway, kind of discovered it midway. Johnson Island, Wake Island. Some, some of these names are familiar from World War II. Guam, we still have. I'll talk about that. Between 1898 and 1946, we held the Philippines. So we're uh, American Samoa, right down here. We still have American Samoa. So our great, we had a good navy by this time. It was, it was now ironclad, sailing all around, and we could not only take these places, but we could defend them, even from the British. We probably had the third greatest navy in the world by 1898. We fought the Spanish-American War, maybe even second. England was clearly better, but maybe Germany and us were tied uh, for second. But all right, so we're going to do all that. And all, most all of it was a result of the Spanish-American War, which was fought under President McKinley. The Spanish-American War was fought in 1898, it only lasted about three months. Some books call it the Hundred Days War. We only lost about 300 men in combat, 2,200 to disease, so about 2,500 altogether. But that's it. And it was a very brief war. We forced a peace treaty. A lot of heroes emerged from the war, even though it was brief. Uh, Commodore Dewey, soon to be Admiral Dewey. Well, he was already an admiral. Commodore was the lowest admiral. Uh, admiral Dewey, Teddy Roosevelt went up what? San Juan Hill in 1898, uh, leading the Rough Riders. Uh, there's a football team in Canada called the Rough Riders. Uh, and it, what the most books don't tell you is right aside of Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders taking a tougher hill were a group of black soldiers called the Buffalo Soldiers. And they really did more fighting than the Rough Riders. But the Rough Riders had the advantage of having this egomaniac, Teddy Roosevelt, who was very brave as their leader, and they happened to be white, where the black uh, Buffalo Soldiers didn't get the credit they deserved. Teddy Roosevelt uh, was given a, a posthumous Medal of Honor. For, he, he campaigned openly, openly. He was what an egomaniac. Thank God we never had another president like that. Uh, what, 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 what? Oh, Eisenhower, I know, yeah. All right. So, uh, Teddy Roosevelt got the Medal of Honor in 2001. The Congress voted him the Medal of Honor. Bill Clinton actually gave it to his family. 2001, just before Bush came in. Uh, and the only father and son combinations to have Medal of Honors, Teddy Roosevelt and his son, Teddy Jr., was a general in World War II. He was the first general to go ashore at D-Day, and he died of a heart attack shortly after D-Day. But he was a very brave guy. He died in, in, in the service, but not of combat wounds, but the heart attack. He was old, and he, he, he used his connections to stay in the service, even though he was overage, and his heart gave out at, shortly after D-Day. But he was given a Medal of Honor. Teddy was given one posthumously. And the only other father and son combination, you should know it, Douglas MacArthur, of course, and his father, Arthur MacArthur, who fought in the Civil War. So the MacArthurs and the Roosevelts are the only ones with the Father-Son Medal of Honor. There you go. All right. The Spanish-American War, I don't have time. I don't want to go over all of it. Many people say it was fought to free Cuba. Cuba was under Spanish rule. It was the last great relic of the once great Spanish empire in the New World. Cuba was their last empire, last link of their old empire. But, all right, and the most famous battles in the Spanish-American War took place in Cuba. There weren't that many. San Juan Hill, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the battle of Santiago Bay, which was a naval battle, and yes, okay, wonderful. But we also say that we fought the war to free Cuba, and the reason we fought is the Spanish flew up the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor, killing almost 300 Americans. They blew up an American battleship, not an American private ship, a battleship, the Maine. They blew it up in February of 1898. A couple of months later, we declare war. By the end of the summer, the war is over. One thing about the Maine, I don't have a lot of time. 
There was always an argument that Spanish did not blow up the Maine, because Spain did not want a war with us. They, they knew they could not beat us and our Navy in a war around Cuba, 3,000 miles away from Spain. They knew that, so they were trying to avoid the war. Why would they blow up the Maine, which was inconsequential to the American Navy? It didn't make sense. The answer is they didn't. Years later, the Navy raised the Maine. And what they found, they didn't like because they sunk it again. <laughs> but later on, a guy named Hyman Rickover, the father of the American nuclear fleet, subs and all that, great American, uh, but I hated him because he said we should give up recess when I was in grade school uh, and study math and science. And I loved every subject in school except math and science. So I don't say Hyman Rickover to me. All right. Uh, Hyman Rickover had it in his crotch, something was wrong here. And he, he went down and they studied the Maine again. They raised it a little bit with Frogman and all that. And they found out that the Maine's armor was blown outward, which meant the explosion that sunk it was what? Inside. If the, a mine planted by Spain had blown up the Maine, it would have been bent, the armor would have been bent inward. It was bent outward. If you're ever going to rob your own house for insurance money, the one thing you have to do is break the window from the outside. Don't break it from the inside. That's the first thing the adjusters look for, I'm telling you. I, but anyway, uh, we went in, you know why we went into war? We had ul ulterior motors. But also there was a tremendous media called the Yellow Press. Uh, these tremendous newspapers that now were dailies, and people were buying them, they were getting home delivery, for God's sake. Everybody was reading these usually sensationalistic newspapers called the Yellow Press. And the two greatest practitioners were William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And they were competing against each other, trying to get excitement going. And Hearst said, I'll start this damn war. And more than any one individual, William Randolph Hearst started the Spanish-American War. He told a couple fibs, stretched a Our media now does not do that. It's all fact. Uh, no sensationalism, no, no exaggerations, no hyperbole. Uh, but, but William Randolph Hearst, he said, uh, he, he sent a guy to down to Cuba to draw pictures of atrocities. He said, if they're not there, draw them anyway. I'll, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. And Hearst claimed he, he, one of the greatest movies he's ever made, uh, Orson Welles' uh, Citizen Kane. The only gripe I have with Citizen Kane, other than Orson Welles was a little overweight, but, and, and Hearst wasn't, but, but uh, the, uh, the only argument I have there, he didn't get into Hearst really causing the Spanish-American War, although Pulitzer was right behind. In fact, Pulitzer felt so guilty about that helping to cause a war and all, and having this yellow journalism, that he set up a trust fund to award literary excellence. Ever win a Pulitzer Prize? So that was founded by one of the yellow pressers, Joseph Pulitzer, who helped start the Spanish-American War, but even more so Hearst. All right, to show you that we were really not fighting this war to free Cuba, where did the war start? In Cuba? No. Remember Bugs Bunny used to dig through the world, come out on the other side? Well, if, if Bugs would dig through the world, come out on the other side, probably be in the Philippines. Right? Okay. The first thing we did on May 1st, 1898, just after the war was declared, literally a week or so, William McKinley and his secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy, a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, had ordered Commodore George Dewey to sail into Manila Bay, the Philippines, which Spain owned, assumed the war would be declared, which it was, by a few hours, but it was, uh, and, and take Manila, destroy a, a, a relic of a Spanish fleet in Manila Bay, and we'll claim the Philippines after the war, because we wanted now a station in the Pacific to help us with the Pacific trade, and we thought the Philippines would be just perfect. So the first great battle of the Spanish-American War was not in Cuba, but where? The opposite end of the world, in the Philippines. And Dewey, George Dewey, sailed into Manila Bay, destroyed the whole Spanish fleet. He, his fleet was the best in the world. Terrible mismatch, but uh, he became a hero, I, I think a little unfairly. The Spanish fleet was no match, but he captured or sunk every Spanish ship. He killed over 400 Spaniards and only lost one man. And for weeks, Hearst argued, did Dewey suffer one casualty? I mean, this is what they're arguing about. We wiped out a Spanish fleet, killed hundreds of men. But did we lose one? Well, the guy that died, died of a heart attack while he was gunning. 
So does he count as a war dead or not? And it, it, this was headlines. Do, do, do you count this guy as, oh my God. But Dewey became a sensation. He eventually, if I have time, I'm going to get into what was, he was immediately promoted from Commodore, which was like a one-star admiral at that time. We don't have that rank anymore, to full admiral. So he skipped two ranks in between. The, if you're a Navy guy or a woman, that's the only man in American history who went from a one-star admiral or general to a four-star overnight. He skipped two grades, which then was Rear Admiral and Vice Admiral. If you're in the Navy and you have hemorrhoids, the piles, who operates on you? The Rear Admirals. <laughs> well, Dewey never bothered being a Rear Admiral. All right. So we took the Philippines. Then we did fight in Cuba. We, the, Teddy Roosevelt resigned as secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy, joined the Army, formed a Rough Rider Regiment, of, supposed to be cavalry, but they didn't have enough uh, ships to get horses over to Cuba for the most part, so they, they really weren't uh, cavalry, they were more on foot. Uh, and the, the real leader of the Rough Riders, Roosevelt, was a lieutenant colonel, but the guy who was leader of the Rough Riders was a colonel, soon to be general, Leonard Wood. You ever hear of Fort Leonard Wood? Well, this Leonard Wood, I mean, what a guy. He was a medical doctor. He was on Walter Camp's first All-American football team, and he happened to be a general. My God, and he should have been president of the United States, but he wouldn't run. In 1920, they, Republicans begged him to run. Nah, nah. Who wants to be president when you're Leonard Wood? Well, okay. Uh, but there's a Fort Leonard Wood now, and this guy's a, man, a medical doctor, a fighter, an All-American football player. My God. Okay, well, anyway, the Rough Riders won there, and our Navy defeated the Spanish Navy. All right, so we're going to have a treaty. What's the treaty? Spain will give Cuba its independence. They will give us the Philippines, and Guam, and Puerto Rico, just off Cuba, which we still hold. We still hold Guam. That's how we got Guam. And we got the Philippines. An argument. The Spanish said, yeah, but you occupied the Philippines a couple days late because the war was back east. And you know, uh, when we finally pulled down a Spanish flag in Manila and put our flag up, it was two days after the truce. So Spain said, we can't give you the Philippines. You didn't really cut Technically, you didn't. We said, we'll give you 20 million. You have it. And the uh, Spanish gave us the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico. We gave them 20 million. And they gave Cuba its independence. Kind of. We insisted that Cuba write a constitution or adopt the constitution that we wrote. And in it, it agreed to make the United States the overlord of Cuba. We would have veto power over their budgets. If they ever got in trouble, we would have the right to intervene without their asking or even without their permission. So we would kind of be the protector of Cuba. Also exploit their sugar fields and stuff like that. Okay. And also they would give us a naval base that we badly needed. We were projecting building the Panama Canal, which we would start under Teddy Roosevelt a few years later, finished in 1914. But we needed a, a naval base, a big one, somewhere uh, on the eastern end of Cuba. And the Cubans said, take anything you want. We took Guantanamo Bay. And we still have it today. Remember Jack Nicholson defended that and a few good men. That's, remember he said, I'm looking right across fence at commies. Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and we, in effect, were the overlords of Cuba until Castro came in. In fact, in the Cuban constitution that we wrote was the so-called Platt Amendment, P-L-A-T-T, -T, named after an American senator, the Platt Amendment. It said that we had the right to intervene in Cuban affairs while they were independent, could elect their own government, that's not fine. But we had the right to intervene when we thought they were getting in trouble, especially borrowing money from foreign countries, which would give them the excuse to invade if Cuba didn't pay. So especially we wanted to control their debt. That got Mexico into trouble time and time again. Borrowing money, not paying back, somebody's going to raid them. Okay, so we, in effect, did take over Cuba. But we really lost control in 1959 but we still have Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the Platt Amendment was dissolved by, Fra that was the word he used, Franklin Roosevelt dissolved uh, the Platt Amendment in the 1930s, trying to build up our friendship in Latin America, fine. Uh, but 
when we dissolved the Platt Amendment and really cut Cuba free in that sense, we also had an agreement there that Guantanamo Bay would remain part of the American, our territory until we wanted to give it back. And so far we haven't. Now any president that would give Guantanamo Bay back to Cuba would be out of his mind, wouldn't he or her mind? I think he'd be lynched the next day, especially if he went down to South Florida. My God, uh, your life expectancy would be minus two days there. So after, because of this Spanish-American war, we got all of that, the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. We had come, Hawaii was an independent country, originally called the Sandwich Islands. It was being ruled by a queen named Lily Yuo Kalani. But Americans, we had dominated Hawaii for about half a century, especially the Dole Company. The, the Dole Company had all kind of agents over there and was a big employer and all that. And we had been toying with annexing the Hawaiians. And if they had been WASP, we what? We would have annexed Hawaii, no question about it. But during the Spanish-American War, McKinley argued that we needed a halfway stopping off point for troop ships and for supply ships between San Francisco and the Philippines. What's about halfway, well not quite, between San Francisco and the Hawaii? So in 1898, using the war as an excuse and saying that Admiral Dewey needed reinforcements, which he didn't, but we, we then annexed Hawaii, more or less, I'd say 60-40, the Hawaiians supported that. Not all Hawaiians were anxious to be annexed. Nobody was gonna cause a war over it. I'd say a majority of the Hawaiians felt they'd be better off under American rule, but not all of them, and we didn't give them a choice. We just what? Annexed them, and the excuse was we needed to resupply uh, Admiral Dewey and the boys over in the Philippines. Now, this is the first, when we added Puerto Rico, we added Hawaii, and we added the Philippines. That's the first time in our history of great expansion that we added people that were not white, not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but certainly not white, white. They were not contiguous to the United States, right? And they were uh, very heavily populated. When we took Alaska, the Eskimos weren't white, okay, but there weren't any, many of them there. We took California, all right, the Mexicans weren't, but there weren't many there. But now we're taking these heavily populated, populous, non-contiguous, I love that word, non-contiguous areas uh, for the first time in our history. Heavily populated, non-contiguous areas that could not, non-white, that could not be quickly assimilated into the American mainstream. Hawaii didn't become a state until 1959. We had a lot of trouble with the Philippines. I'll just make it quick. We held the Philippines until 1946. They didn't like it one bit. In fact, when we, we promised the Philippines their independence, as soon as the war was over, we immediately broke that promise. The Filipinos then rose in rebellion against us, fought a guerrilla war. Between, 18, between uh, 1898 and 1902, there was an unofficial, uh, undeclared war, guerrilla war against the Philippines, now called the Filipino War. We lost 4,000 men in that. We only lost 2,500 men in the Spanish-American. We lost 4,000 in that guerrilla war against the Filipinos. That's where we learned the water cure, how to torture. The Filipinos are great at that. We emulated them. And if you ever hear that water cure, that came from the Spanish or the Cuban or Filipino insurrection after the Spanish-American War. We held the Philippines till after World War II. Uh, did you ever hear of Leyte Gulf? When MacArthur said, I shall return, where was he running from? The Philippines. He was leaving the Philippines to go to Australia, but he said what? Not we shall return, what? I shall return. He left his army there, but that's another story. Okay, I uh, left Wainwright there to, <laughs> uh, I, there, there's a guy that deserves a lot more credit. He gets a guy named Wainwright that the Japanese captured, and when he was released, he was like this thick, you know. Uh, oh my God, uh, Matt Wainwright. I, sorry, but I, my heart, whenever I hear that guy, 
My mother I always pitied. My mother gained a lot of weight at one time, and she always pitied people who were too skinny. And Wainwright was just full of a man. But when he, after three and a half years of captivity, he was barely alive. But MacArthur did let him sit aboard the battleship Missouri when MacArthur accepted the surrender of the Japanese. There you go. All right, but we, we took the Philippines. Uh, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, I shall return. You ever hear of the Bataan Death March? That was in World War II when the Japanese conquered the Philippines. At first, we took it back, but that's when they got a bunch of our soldiers and marched them uh, through the Bataan Peninsula to uh, uh, prisoner of war camps. Many of them died. The Bataan Death March, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the greatest naval battle ever fought, period, was fought off the coast of the Philippines as MacArthur was coming back. Uh, he wanted to clear the uh, Japanese Navy away from the Philippines, and that led to the Battle of Leyte Gulf. My gosh. And then in 19 1946, we did give the Philippines their independence with the idea that we would retain Subic Bay, big naval base, and Clark Field, the big air base, and we did not evacuate those bases until the early 1990s. So after the Spanish-American War, we get the Philippines, but our luck is running out. We then get into the Filipino War, we pay a terrible price in the Pacific to defend the Philippines. We actually lose them during World War II when MacArthur said, I shall return, and Wainwright's army then has to surrender. Remember Corregidor, all right, uh, and all of that. Uh, uh, he had to surrender. Uh, and then uh, we terrible battles fighting when MacArthur got back, terrible fighting to retake the Philippines. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so we paid a price there. We paid a price for what we did to Mexico uh, with the Civil War. So maybe our luck is running out. But that was our last great uh, addition during the 1800s. But then are we done? Not quite. There's Admiral Dewey. Was he a six-star admiral? I'm, I'm a bug on these ranks. Nowadays, I think the Navy has a rear admiral, lower, rear admiral, upper, vice admiral, and four stars, a full admiral. Like the Army is brigadier general, major general, lieutenant general, and full general. At, during World War II only, we had five stars. And the Army's five stars, MacArthur, Marshall, Eisenhower, Bradley, right, and uh, uh, Hap Arnold, okay? And the Navy had five-star admirals. They were called fleet admirals. The uh, generals were called general of the armies. You know why our, they were supposed to be uh, field marshals? Our five stars were the equivalent of field marshals, like Field Marshal Montgomery for the British, right? But you know why we didn't call our guys field marshals? The first five star that we ever had was George Marshall, the Marshall plan later on, but he was head of, he could have fired MacArthur one day and Eisenhower the next day. That's how powerful he was. I met Mrs., uh, Mrs. Omar Bradley. He was the last five-star general. He was given the fifth star just after the war. But anyway, he was the last one to die. But anyhow, you know why they're not called field marshals? Because George Marshall was a very eccentric guy. Brilliant, I think one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. But George Marshall told Roosevelt in Congress, I will never take the title field marshal because I will not be called field marshal marshal. And they said, well, if we don't promote you, you got to go first. We then can't promote MacArthur, Eisenhower, Hap Arnold, Brad. We can't. you got to be first. Well, tough luck. And MacArthur went ballistic. When he heard that, he's screaming at Marshall through some kind of transoceanic guy. I don't know how he was you got to take it, because I'm second. I'm second. So finally, Marshall gave in with the idea we'd call him general of the Army. And the, admiral, the Navy was called fleet admirals. If you had five stars in the Navy, I know you're wondering, do I know who? Yeah, Leahy, King, Nimitz, and later on a guy named Bull Halsey. Okay, all right, so they, they were the fleet admirals. But Dewey was later on declared Admiral of the Navy, and that would imply a six star. So he was the only living American who ever had more than five stars by being called. Admiral of the Navy, that gave him one step above Fleet Admiral. And if Fleet Admiral is five, then what? Then he's got to be six. So was he our only six-star military guy ever? And all he did, I mean, he was a great man, I'm not arguing, but all he did, his greatest achievement was to wipe out a dilapidated Spanish fleet, some of them that were moored hulks. They didn't, their engines weren't working. 
And he had this great fleet headed by the Olympia, which was so good it was even used in World War II. I, his, his flagship was the Olympia. My God, but he gets six stars. All right, maybe, maybe not. All right. A little trivia. One of the, uh, we haven't had a five-star admiral or general since World War II. They're the only people, with one other exception, when they retire, they get full salary for life. And any raises that the Army or Navy get, they get. And they get a chef, a private plane if they want one, and a residency paid for. MacArthur lived in the Waldorf Astoria until the day he died. How about not? Motel 6. Tom Bedette will keep the uh, light on for you, Doug. Yeah, he went to the Waldorf which is now they have a suite up there, the Wall MacArthur Suite, which is like a, a tourist thing. All right, the only other people that get full salary on retirement for life, not the president, not the congressman, not the federal judges. Why these judges stay in their 80s and 70s and 90s, I don't know. Because they could retire in their 50s and get what? Full salary. It goes back to Roosevelt's court packing scheme, trying to get judges to quit because they get life sentences, life terms. I had a cousin got a life term because he robbed the bank with a gun. Uh, in 1917, our, la our last great purchase, we bought, there's Puerto Rico, which we got after the Spanish-American War. There's Guantanamo Bay would be right here. In 1917, World War I had been raging in Europe for four, or since 1914. We had not gotten any yet. But German submarines were beginning to roam around the waters of the Caribbean and the American coastline. So, the Denmark was trying to stay neutral in World War I, which it did. It was conquered by the Germans in World War II. But in World War I, Denmark managed to stay out of it, which was in its own best interest. But they knew they couldn't defend the Danish West Indies. So they offered to sell it to us, and we bought, we bought on April 1st, 1917, what the Danish West Indies, which became the American Virgin Islands. It's about 50 islands and Ks and whatever you want to call them. But the three main islands were St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix. We still hold them today. Was that lucky that we had these bases and all there? We declared war six days later. We went into World War I on April 6th, took over these islands on April 1st. Isn't that something? Did we sense something coming? You're darn right we did. We were on the verge of war, but we had stayed out of it for, since 1914. Uh, but finally our will broke, and the, the fact that we had the Virgin Islands was, was really good. All right, now, we're not going to do it. Here's the last thing I want to do, because Aaron wanted to have some questions. And I won't, uh, I know people get antsy, so uh, just we'll make it quick. Here are, here's our, our empire now. We still hold, these are commonwealths. All of these areas, th these areas have American citizenship, and they're called organized, unincorporated commonwealths of the United States. Organized, but unincorporated means not states. We have American Samoa, which we got in the late 19th century. Our Navy simply pushed our way in there, had nothing to do with Spain. I see it has a population of 56,000. Guam, which we got after the Spanish-American War, that's still part of it. We have a, a bunch of islands called the Commonwealth of North Mari Northern Mariana Islands. We got most of these islands after World War II when the UN took them off Japan and gave them us as trusteeships after World War II, and we combined them into what we now call the Commonwealth of the North Mari Northern Mariana Islands. We still have Puerto Rico, which we got after the, and there, there's a lot of pressure to make Puerto Rico a state. It has 3,500,000 people, has way more people than a lot of states. We have six states that don't have a million people. Delaware is very close, but we don't have a million in Delaware. But uh, the smallest state is Wyoming in population, Vermont, North and South Dakota, and Alaska don't have a million people. And there's Puerto Rico sitting with three and a half million. But if they came in, they'd get four congressmen and two senators. And you bet your bippy they'd all be Democrats. So you bet your bippy Republicans aren't going to vote for that. I don't blame them. I mean, that's the way it is. And we still hold the Virgin Islands. All these people are American citizens. They have one non-voting member of Congress in the, in the House, not in the Senate. Uh, but they are not states. And there's no... Uh, a lot of Democrats have this pipe dream that they're going to make 
Washington, D.C., with almost 700,000 people at state, and Puerto Rico, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. But a lot of things are, are good. All right, uh, tomorrow might not happen in my lifetime. I just had a, a few years ago a pretty good heart uh, going over, but somehow I made it. All right, so that's it. Uh, we still hold on, so we're still a little imperialistic. Uh, have we done a lot more good than harm for the world? Oh, yes, please understand that. Uh, have we been good to these people? Yes. Would any of them break away from us? No. Guarantee you they wouldn't. Uh, one last thing, I know you don't know where to go. Commonwealth of North Marianas are just northeast of the Philippines. The main islands, there are like hundreds, but the main islands are Saipan, Saipan which uh, World War II, big battle there, Saipan. Uh, uh, Tinian and Rhoda, and there are a whole bunch of other islands. There's Guam, but that's not part of North Marianas. Uh, you know what happened to Tinian during World War II? That's where the Enola Gay took off from with the first atom bomb. And that's where the second atom bomb and boxcar took over and blasted Nagasaki after uh, the, uh, they had big airfield in Tinian. And that's where the Enola Gay went over to Hiroshima. And we still hold Tinian. And a lot of American manufacturers have moved to those islands because the wages are lower. And business is booming. If you need a job, there are a lot around now, but if you really want a good permanent job, move to one of these joints. Weather's good. You're an American citizen. Your children will be American citizens by birth, and most of them, nothing to lose. They don't pay the direct American income tax. Happy days are here again. All right, I want to thank you deeply, but we're going to have air. You want to do it, TJ?